Okay, so in this video, we're going to review some state, describe, and explain type questions for mechanics. And this is the first week we're doing this. There'll be further weeks as we go through the course. Okay, so let's. Okay, so the first thing is if she returns to the same height, she finishes with the same amount of energy to start with. And we know that there'll be work done by air resistance. So she must be doing work with her legs that is equal to that so that she can return to the same height and finish with the same energy she started. So that's how the resistive forces factor in. But starting at H, the first energy transfer that happens is GP is transferred into kinetic energy as she moves downwards. And then as she lands on the trampoline, her kinetic energy is then transferred into elastic potential energy, stretching out the springs. Then as she rebounds and starts going back upwards, this elastic potential energy is transferred back into kinetic energy. And then finally, when she reaches her maximum height, that kinetic energy will have been transferred back into GPE, which is equal to the GPE she started with. So that would be how I describe the energy transfer going on there. Okay, so next question. So we've got a boy throwing a ball vertically upwards and lets it fall all the way to the ground. So we can see from the graph on the left hand side, it's starting above the ground, but it's going to finish up on the ground at the end. State which feature of a displacement time graph represents the velocity. So this is just a fact you have to know. You should know that the gradient of this graph is the velocity of the object. OK, so then draw the shape of the velocity time graph for the ball between T0 and T2. And the starting point is labeled X. So uh, let's first use this graph to describe it and then we'll sketch it. So first of all, we know the acceleration is going to be constant because it's going to be acted on by gravity or the weight force of the object. So we expect the velocity versus time graph to be a straight line graph. The velocity as it moves upwards is going to decrease to zero and then it's going to turn around and come down and become increasingly negative. Then it's going to hit the ground and it's going to become positive again as it bounces back upwards. So that's generally how we describe it. what's going to happen. So let's now draw that. So this is what we'd expect to see. So it decreases to zero at T1 when it's reached its maximum height, then becomes increasingly negative down to T2 where it hits the ground. And then that's all it asks for. But if we were to start drawing it again, you can see it would jump up to being positive again as it bounces back upwards after it hits the ground. OK, so we've now got uh, a diagram showing the ball and it, you can see it's deforming as it hits the ground um, and it's at the point where it's stationary, for instance, and it's reached its maximum deformation. You can see here. Explain how Newton's third law of motion applies to figure two. OK, so we know that the ground will be applying a normal contact force upwards on the ball. That's why the ball has stopped and has deformed. So what Newton's third law tells us is the ball is applying an equal normal contact force, so the same type of force, in the opposite direction. So in this case, downwards on the ground. So then it wants us to explain why there is a resultant force upward on the ball. So what it must be is that the upward normal contact force acting on the ball from the ground must be greater than the downward weight force of the ball. And that's why the resultant force is upwards. All right, so moving on to a projectile type question. So we've got the path of a tennis ball following the, in the absence of air resistance and it's hit horizontally at A, as you can see. So the first thing, explain why the path of the ball is curved. So there's two parts to explaining the, the curved shape. So the first is that the object is only acted on by a vertical weight force. So the horizontal velocity is constant. So the distance traveled in the horizontal direction is a consistent amount as time goes on. But the vertical velocity is going to be increasing or the magnitude of it is going to be increasing 
due to the weight force of the object. And that's why it has this curved shape, because the vertical velocity is becoming increasingly negative. So draw on figure B, the part of the ball hit in the same way A, but is affected by air resistance. So now the velocity in the horizontal direction is not going to be constant. It's going to decrease over time. Um, so what we're going to get is this kind of shape here. So we'd expect it to have a shorter range with air resistance like this. OK, so we're looking at a person carrying out a bungee jump from a high bridge. Tick the appropriate boxes to show the forms that the jumper's energy takes at the different stages of the jump. So start off with at the instant the jumper steps off the bridge. So when you go up on a bridge, what you're starting with is gravitational potential energy. This is why you're able to get kinetic energy as you fall. You start with gravitational potential energy. So at the instant, the elastic bungee rope just becomes taut. So what that's telling you is we haven't started generating elastic potential energy yet. But what we have got a lot of will be kinetic energy because you've fallen, increasing your speed. But you will also still have gravitational potential energy. You haven't reached your lowest point yet, so you're still going to have some gravitational potential energy. And then the instant the jumper reaches the lowest point on the jump, they're going to have elastic potential energy, so all of their kinetic energy has been transferred because that's how they are stationary at their lowest point. And you could definitely argue that they still have some gravitational potential energy depending on where you put the zero line. So you didn't need to have gravitational potential energy, but you certainly could have for this question. OK, so now we're moving on to have a look at some moments as well. So first off, defining a moment of a force. Um, a moment is defined as the product of a force and the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the pivot. So I've illustrated each of those features on this diagram. So we've got the force on the right hand side, we've got the pivot point at the bottom left of the object, the dotted lines show kind of the lines of action. So we're interested in the perpendicular distance between the pivot and the line of action. OK, so we've got a diving board of weight W, which we can see is coming from the middle of the board and it's fixed at A. So A is going to be the pivot. The diving board is supported by a cylinder at C. So that's exerting an upward force P on the board that's keeping it stationary. By considering moments about A, explain why the force P must be greater than the weight force W. So we're going to use A as the pivot because it's going to be the only, it's going to be the point we know is stationary on the board. So taking moments about A, if the board is going to be stationary, we know the moment of P must be equal to the moment of W if it's stationary. But the perpendicular distance of W is much larger. So therefore, the force P must be larger to make the moments equal. That's the key that the moments have to be equal. So state and explain what would be the effect on the force P of a girl walking along the board from A to B. So first thing, again, the board is stationary. So the moment of P must be equal to the moment of W plus the moment of the weight force of the girl, because W and the girl are kind of acting to rotate it in the same direction. So as the girl walks along the board, the perpendicular distance increases. So the force of P must increase to keep moments the same. And it is as simple as that. Okay. So finally, looking at some motion graph work, describe the motion of the train in the following regions of the graph. So with this question, a lot of people knew what was going on, but didn't describe it as clearly as they need to. So between A and B, it's constant acceleration. It's a straight line graph, so the acceleration is constant. Between B and C, it's the velocity that's constant. So we could also describe that as zero acceleration. Between C and D, we can see again, it's a straight line graph, so it's constant acceleration, but it's gonna be negative because it's decreasing the velocity. 
Between D and E, we can see velocity is zero, so we can see it's clearly stationary. And again, between E and F, it's constant negative of acceleration, which we could also describe as accelerating in the opposite direction if we wanted to. OK, so that's describing the graph. So what feature of the graph represents the displacement? Well, it was a velocity time graph, so the area underneath the graph or the area between the graph and the x-axis is the displacement of the train. And using the graph, explain why the distance traveled is different from the displacement. So distance is a scalar. So what we would do is we'd just add up all of the area and that would be the distance traveled. So it doesn't matter if it's above or below the axis for distance, we just add up the area. But for displacement, it's posit it can be positive or negative. So the area above the graph to start with, A, B, C, D, is positive displacement. The Later on, we can see it goes below the x-axis, giving negative displacement. And then when we add them together, that's going to essentially decrease the displacement. So it's going to be less than the distance we have traveled. OK, so that finishes this video looking at stating, describing, and explaining. So this is going to be the first in the series of a number of videos working on this particular skill, because this is something that, generally speaking, a lot of students struggle with and needs to improve. So if you don't understand any of the explanations here, please do comment and let me know, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. But thank you for taking the time to watch.